Hello everyone, Athetos here, and I think it's time to introduce you to my latest 386 Labrat. This one is a budget option and features a soldered 386 S6 CPU. The motherboard is from Sir, and the model is 386 SS. Now this really is a budget solution, and on the heart of all this there is a single chipset, the Sark RC 2016. Then the rest of the things here are the absolute necessary. So here we have an oscillator and a real-time clock. Here is the keyboard controller, the BIOS chip and the clock generator for the CPU. There is no onboard CAS on this motherboard here. And also this board is a very cheap one with only two layers. So yeah, construction wise I don't think this could be done any cheaper. In the end uh, the only thing here that is somewhat uh, high end is the CPU itself that uh, comes from AMD and it is actually the top uh, 40 MHz model. However, of course this is an SX chip and that means that uh, the bus is just 16-bit uh, wide. Compared to the full DX model, this can hurt a lot, especially regarding memory bandwidth. And in combination with the fact that uh, here we don't have any CAS, this can be even worse. Now all this does not matter that much to me. What I really see here is a great potential for modding. And by the end of this uh, series of videos, this might even outperform my DX machine. So at this point I have to note that there are actually quite a few of 3D6 motherboards that use this chipset. And uh, all more or less use the same circuit. Not only that, but a few of them actually use exactly the same layout as this uh, Bektronic BEC uh, 3703. And this Pine Technology PT319A. But even those that have a different layout, the chips and the connectivity is all the same. So anything I say in this video will be applicable to these boards too. But not only that, this also means that uh, there is a chance here to experiment with uh, biases from different motherboards. So now let's see how to configure this uh, motherboard for the best performance. And discuss a bit uh, here the jumpers and all the stuff. The first two ones are down here. This is just uh, the monochrome or color jumper and next to this is the external battery option so nothing too important. Now one of the most unique things about this motherboard is the clocking scheme and actually this is quite strange because the main reference crystal, the 14 MHz one, it's actually far away from the clock generator. So what is really going on here is that uh, this crystal connects to the main chipset. The main chipset uh, generates the reference frequency and also fits it to the clock generator to generate the CPU frequency. The clock generator is okay, this classic 8-pin one. And these always have uh, two jumpers where you can select uh, four frequencies that are typically for 20, 25, 33 and 40 MHz CPUs. Now here one of the jumpers, uh, the GP10, is permanently attached. So we only have GP11 and we can select between uh, 33 MHz and 40. Of course, uh, okay, these uh, are all clock doubled. So the real frequencies that are generated here are double that. But okay, all these are typical for 386 machines. Then another interesting thing is this jumper here that uh, selects between synchronous or asynchronous operation for the floating point unit. Yeah, okay, here of course the floating point unit is missing, uh, but okay, I will fix this in the future. The thing with uh, nearly all floating point units of this era is that uh, they get uh, two different clock inputs, and internally they implement this asynchronous function. So this jumper just tells the floating point unit to operate in one or the other mode. The first clock input of course is the main CPU clock, and the second can come from this uh, crystal that again is missing but I will do something with this in the future. Of course there are limitations even in the asynchronous mode. The two clocks should not be very far apart. But either way this is a flexibility that I want to try. I mean if the floating point unit works at uh, 40 MHz then the CPU can be anything between 33 and 50. And yeah that's all the good news about uh, clocking. The bad one is that the main chipset drives the ESA bus in a fixed frequency and that is half of the reference one, so around uh, 7.16 MHz. There is no way to change this and aside from the lost performance here, I'm actually quite worried that uh, with this uh, scheme it might not even be possible to use my any clock devices here for the CPU. Okay, this is quite technical for me to describe here. In the end, uh, later on this video I will try to put here an any clock device and we will see how this goes. Yeah, there is a chance that uh, with this configuration 
the PC will uh, probably have some random freezes. We will see. Then the final and very important jumper is this one, the GP4. And yeah, I checked the manual and I couldn't find anything. Also, there's nothing written here on the board. And yeah, when I got the board, all the jumpers were missing. So yeah, this was a bit of a problem. So this is a three position jumper. From the one side we have a ground and the other side is a pull up to the VDD. The central pin connects to the sixth pin of the CPU. And according to the 3T6 uh, manual, this pin is the next address pin. It is an input that tells the CPU to use address pipelining for the bus. So when this is activated by pulling this pin to the ground, the CPU is a bit more efficient with the bus and this actually increases the throughput. Something quite important here that we are limited to 16 bits. Also it's stated somewhere else in the manual that uh, when you don't want this function you have to pull it uh, high. And yeah, this is in line with this jumper here. Now with this sun connected uh, I was getting very low results. With this in the pull up position I was getting a little bit better. And as expected the best performance was uh, with this uh, connected to the ground. Or uh, the setting you see here. The difference was more than 10-15%. Then of course another important thing uh, is the turbo button. Again, in order to get the normal performance you have to have this closed. The last important thing here is the memory slots. You have 4 in total. And yeah, okay, as this is a 16-bit machine, you have to put them in pairs. So the machine will work just fine with only two of these. However, again, I noticed that uh, if you populate all of them, in many benchmarks uh, you get a significant boost. So I highly recommend you to also do the same. I don't know why there is a boost there. Maybe, I don't know, some type of interleaving. But yeah, okay, it is what it is. Of course, the memories I'm using here are my own nice 50 nanosecond ones. And that is 4 modules, 4 megabytes each for a total of 16 megabytes. Now, regarding the VGA card I used this time. Okay, you all know my little Trident TVGA 8900. However, this time, because uh, either way we are limited by a very slow ISA bus at uh, 7 MHz, I can take this opportunity to use something a little bit faster. And uh, here I have a Western Digital one. This is the WD90C33ZZ. In general, this one is something like 4-5% uh, faster. However, I had a lot of uh, compatibility troubles with high ISA bus speeds in my DX board. That's why there I used my Trident, but here, as I said, yeah, we will go with uh, this uh, nice Western Digital one. This is the only way to somewhat increase the VGA speed on this machine. The rest of the setup is quite typical, I'm using this ID controller and uh, this adapter to a compact flash card. So that's all for the hardware, time to check the BIOS and the settings there. So as we said regarding BIOSes, there are a lot of alternative ones. And okay, of course I tried all of them. Most of these had the, the same MAMI BIOS as uh, my motherboard. It wasn't exactly the same file, but it was marked in the same date. Some had more options visible than others, but either way, using the AMI setup tool, all were the same. One had an earlier version of this AMI BIOS, but with this one I couldn't get uh, top performance. And finally, one other had an award BIOS that I usually prefer. As this, I don't know, I like the menu more, and uh, usually they have more options. This was also the case here. However, I don't know, with this BIOS again I couldn't get big performance. So in the end the BIOS I used uh, was from this motherboard. This has the same date as uh, my original BIOS. Just a little bit uh, different string and uh, more options in the menu. So now let's uh, go in and check the options. Here the only interesting menu is the advanced CMOS setup. And yeah, these are my optimized settings. The original BIOS, as I said, was the same. It was just missing some of this. But either way, the hidden options were already set in an optimal way. Interesting enough, we have here the Cyrix CAS option. You see this motherboard was sold sometimes with a Cyrix 486 SLC chip. Then there is this AT bus stepping. I'm not 100% sure what this does. But with disabled I got a little bit better buffered ID performance. This is the refresh cycle for the DRAM. And you have various options here. But the best is low. This actually means that the memory will actually refresh more rarely. Then this looks like the wait states for the memory. And you have two options here. The zero wait states has this 2 clock clock 2 description. 
I'm not again very sure about this. You see when I used only two memory modules, in some games I got better performance with the one wait state option. But uh, when I had uh, all populated, these two are more or less the same. So in the end I used uh, this zero wait state here. And then some timings for Raspberry Charge and the Rust to cast width. The lower here the better, and you have the option between 4 and 6, so the best is 4. Now other than that, uh, I chose this time to shadow the video ROM and the system ROM. This has some small benefits here and there. You lose a little bit of uh, RAM, but yeah, this is not that important. So that's all with the BIOS settings. So time to do the any clock mode. And uh, okay, here I have two of these, one white, one black. I think I will go with the black one this time. So if we have a close-up look here, we have okay this typical 8-pin chip that is placed within the area of a 14-pin uh, oscillator. That means that, uh, okay, we know that uh, this pin here is the clock out. And uh, yeah, in a very classic manner, this connects to the 6th pin of the clock generator here. So normally in these cases I just uh, isolate the 6th pin and yeah, I can solder my any clock device on top of this. So I always keep the old oscillator here. The reason for that is that uh, the oscillator typically also generates the reference frequency that is still needed. However, here the reference frequency is generated by the main chipset and then just forwarded here. So in the end, uh, yeah, I'm going for a cleaner approach. So here I'm gonna totally remove the clock generator and this jumper and then solder my any clock device. So let's do this. And of course, uh, first of all, you want to refresh the solder on all these pins. And then, okay, just use a pump or something. For such a small number of uh, through hole pins, okay, even a manual pump is okay. So here I removed everything, uh, the old chip and the two jumpers and opened all the holes. Now I just have to prepare the any clock device. First of all, I will remove the middle pins and yeah, then uh, put them here and solder them. So yeah, here we are. And then there is this little dot here that uh, signifies the first pin. And uh, here also in the motherboard we have this marking here as a first pin. So this goes this way. And then uh, yeah, I just have to solder it on the motherboard and we are finished. You just uh, want to leave some spacing here between the device and the motherboard. So that uh, yeah, you don't have any shorts. So basically what I'm doing here is that I just place it so that only a little bit is left here. So when I solder it, there will be no excess to cut. So here we are. And we are done. Quite easy, right? Now let's, let's place a 20 MHz crystal here. And uh, two jumpers on the position low low. I'm using some orange ones to keep the whole uh, black orange theme the same. So with this setting we have uh, 20 MHz uh, times 4, that is 80 MHz, and this is exactly the same as we had before for this uh, 40 MHz CPU. So okay, here is the moment of truth, let's see. Hmm, this looks okay. So yeah, here we are, everything looks fine. No problems in the end with any clock device, but uh, okay. Just to make sure, let's run some benchmarks. It's also a good opportunity to give you some results for my fully optimized 386 uh, 6 at uh, 40 MHz. I already know more or less how this performs, so it's also a good test to see if there is any difference now with any clock device. And let's start with check it. And I will do first of all a test for the real-time clock. This is just to test that all the reference clocks are generated correctly. Yeah, no problems here. And let's go to the benchmarks. Here is the main system one, and it is around 23 times faster than an IBM XT. This is the video system benchmark, 30 and 17 times faster. And finally the hard disk one, and here we have around 2 megabytes per second, and a sick time of 0.1 milliseconds. Very nice. Then some VGA speed tests, and first is VGA speed, with 29.41 frames per second. Now in bit speed, the VGA write speed uh, peaks at 3940. This is a very high result for an ESA bus that is only clocked at uh, 7 MHz. And all this is due to the Western Digital VGA card I'm using. So let's now see Landmark. Yeah, again we can see here the very fast VGA speed and the equivalent uh, 50 MHz 
XTPC performance. Well, okay, here the clock is around 40 MHz. And yeah, here is Spitzes. Yeah, in the top uh, left corner it says uh, 386DX, but yeah, okay, this is my system. So it is an SX chip. The memory bandwidth is reported there very high. I don't know why. Then uh, we get a score of 7.07. Uh, .07. This is a quite high score. And yeah, probably the highest I have ever seen from anyone running a 386 at uh, 40 megahertz. And then on the bottom right corner we have the memory throughput at 22.2 megabytes per second. This is also a quite good result. And it was only possible after I optimized the system. Writing speed is quite a bit faster at around 30. And of course we don't have any casses here. Hard disk speed also with optimization is quite fast. Again at around 2 megabytes per second. Then I will run just a quick uh, cast check tool. Of course we don't have any casses here but it will also tell us about the memory. So here the memory speed is 18.5 megabytes per second. So now time for some real benchmarks and games. And I will go with option 2 and 3D bands. And this is 11.6. Yeah this is a very good result for a system like that. Now PC player benchmark. And here we get a 2.5. Again a very good result. So finally I will save me the pain and only run uh, do minimum details this time with option A. So let's see, uh, this looks quite fast actually. And this is 4035 real ticks or 18.5 frames per second. So yeah, I'm quite happy with all these results. I now have a solid base performance for my 386SX machine. And yeah, these results will be good for later comparisons. So I think it's a good time to try some overclocking. But let's now go and try 50 MHz. What? First try doesn't boot. So yeah, okay, uh, this is not gonna happen. I even tried to raise the voltage from 5 volt to 5.2 and uh, this also didn't help. The board uh, starts booting around 45 MHz and in the end it was only stable around uh, 43.7. Now, okay, this is not much. But either way, I will take it. It is something like a 9% overclock. And yeah, this is what I have here. To tell you the truth, uh, this is not surprising. This motherboard is constructed as cheaply as possible. For sure, I know that uh, the problem is not with the memories. I mean, I tried the lower timings and nothing changed. The CPU should be also okay. 45 MHz is nothing for a chip like that. So then uh, there might be a limitation with this chipset. But again, I think that the problem is with this motherboard. This is a two-layer one, and two-layer boards have very high noise. And uh, yeah, if this is the case, I cannot do much. For sure, after a certain frequency, you have a lot of problems with two-layer boards. Then another very likely reason for all that is that there are also no clock buffers here. The output of the clock generator directly drives the CPU, the floating point unit, and the main chipset. And this is a significant load for our little clock generator. If that is the case, uh, the situation should get a bit worse when I also install the floating point unit. And in general, I might be able to do something here by maybe placing some pull-up, pull-down resistors and see if there's any difference. Either way, okay, this is just the first result. And of course, I will come back to you with more overclocking in the future. So here in the speed, it uh, looks like everything is up for about uh, 10%. And uh, okay, this makes sense. VGA speed is also up, and uh, so is also VIT speed. I cannot really tell why this is the case here. I mean, the ISA clock does not really scale with the CPU clock, and it's still at 7 MHz. Most likely, the bottleneck here is with the CPU bus itself. Okay, the bus might be very fast, but it's still 16 bit and it has to handle both the ISA traffic and all the RAM traffic. So, yeah. Then uh, 3D bands. 12.5, not that bad. And PC player benchmark, 2.7. Yeah, again, an increase of about 9-10%. Uh, so finally some doom. And uh, yeah, that is uh, 3710 real ticks or 20.1 frames per second. Yeah, not bad, we crossed the 20 frames per second mark. And this concludes my overclocking results. Yeah, okay, for now. So finally let me address really fast uh, how I did this lithium cell battery mod here. Of course uh, this is not how this motherboard came in. Well yeah I actually got this as a non-working part. 
but I was fortunate enough that uh, all the damage was focused on the socket of the BIOS chip. So I went in, cleaned the socket and the chip, and in the end everything was working just fine, with only minimal damage here to the copper lines. Of course the socket is still uh, badly damaged, and I might consider replacing it in the future. So let's see. Of course we are here for the mod. And uh, yeah, things here are quite straightforward. This topology is quite similar to the one that was on my 486 motherboard. So what we have here is a resistor and diode in series that is used to charge the battery. So okay, this comes from 5 volts with a diode and then a 150 ohm resistor to the positive terminal. So of course uh, these two were removed. Either way I had to remove this because I needed more space here for the socket. Then we have these two diodes. And yeah, these two are here just to combine the output of the battery and the external battery. And uh, our diode of interest here is this one. So again I replaced this with a shot kit diode to reduce the voltage drop. The one I used here is the 1N5817. We can see that the common node here through a resistor, yeah this is probably 1 kilo ohm, goes to power the real time clock. And also another resistor, this probably comes from 5 volt, does the same thing. The 5 volt are blocked by the diodes, so again we don't have a problem here with charging this battery. So basically with this resistor, when the system is powered, the real time clock draws from the 5 volt rail, thus reducing the discharging of the battery. Finally, of course, okay, I had to put here the socket, and uh, this was placed uh, quite nicely, close to the edge of the board, but not exceeding it. However, before placing it here, I had to bend uh, the pins a little bit inwards, because you see the spacing of these uh, two holes is actually less than the spacing of the pins in the socket. The difference is not that big, so in the end everything fitted just perfectly. So let's check this out. On the battery we have uh, 3.2 volts and on the output of the diode it is 3.13 quite nice this probably goes here right yeah correct it powers the oscillator and the real-time clock these chips are actually combo chips uh, real-time clock and uh, CMOS memory so now I think it's a good point to end this video everything went uh, quite well today the any clock device worked uh, just fine and yeah, we are gonna have a lot of fun here. Of course I'm gonna replace this uh, soldered processor and try many different ones by placing some pin headers here and then using this board. And uh, here is how this looks with the CPU. This is one of the best CPUs with a 386 16-bit bus interface. The 486SXLC2. It has a clock uh, doubler and 8 kilobytes of level 1 CAS. Of course, at the back I have a voltage regulator, because this is a 3.3 volt chip. But yeah, more about all that on uh, my next video. As usual, you know what to do if you don't want to miss this. Yeah, subscribe. It will only take you one click to do so. Other than that, uh, you know, likes, comments, I always like those. So that is for today. See you again on the next one.